house better call somebody Hey yo, it's me, it's me, the R to the P, and yes, you better call somebody and tell them that the Old Culture Podcast has new merch. Finally! 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 Yes, finally, more than 20 items in stock at oldculturepodcast.com slash merch. Slap that sigil on your chest like a Superman or Wonder Woman and spread the message of infinite love, truth, and awareness. Both unisex and women's fits now available in a slew of different styles, including high-quality American apparel, tees, tanks, crop tops, hoodies, and long sleeves, plus designs that show off your wokeness, and hats for the alchemist deep within you because we are on a mission to make America great again. (laughs) Oh, no, Donald, you silly fuck. That's make alchemy great again. So transmute your wardrobe from lead to gold and conjure up oldculturepodcast.com slash merch. And you know what? Do that now and use coupon code Equinox and enjoy 10% off on all orders from now through the Fall Equinox. That's now through Sunday, September 23rd. You gotta be fucking kidding. Nah, dude, I'm not. I've labored for far too long on this to let this merch just sit around 10% off through Sunday, September 23rd with the coupon code Equinox at oculturepodcast.com slash merch. That's through the web store, not the Etsy shop. So follow the link in the show notes and manifest your heart's desire for some new swag because what fun is casting spells and summoning spirits without cozy ritual attire? So culturepodcast.com slash merch, use the coupon code Equinox, that's E-Q-U-I-N-O-X, and get 10% off all orders for the rest of the summer. Now let's drop that needle and roll that intro. Yo, from the Kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where the Aeon of Cthulhu is in full effect. And I know this because I had my first mermaid encounter recently. More on that soon if you're on Patreon. Anyway, I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. The one and only Thomas Sheridan is in the house. Thomas is the author of Sorcery, The Invocation of Strangeness, self-published recently on Lulu.com. And the book focuses on magic as a real force in the world employed by powerful people, as most of us overstand by now. But it's an honest and practical approach to defending yourself against that force. This is one of the best books on the subject I've read, and one of the most entertaining, because not only is it narrated by one of the most outspoken sorcerers you'll find anywhere it also contains a ton of awesome stories and anecdotes and as thomas describes himself in his facebook profile he has no interest in waking you up he's here to improve the quality of your dreaming and hopefully after an hour or two if you're a patron your dreams will be much improved so enough prologue let's flip the script to dialogue and conjure up ireland's most magnificent magician mr thomas sheridan enjoy Pencil. Thomas Sheridan. Man, it's so great to have you here. Big fan of your work. Thanks for your time. I'm delighted to be here, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. No problem, man. So I always ask first-time guests for, I call it their magical origin story, and I'm sure you've told it a hundred times, but you know, please do tell the listeners who aren't familiar with you a bit about yourself and how you came to be such a uh, prolific practitioner of the pagan arts. It is kind of a magical story. Well, I was born on the north side of Dublin in uh, in Ireland uh, in in a quite a, a tough working class inner city area. Uh, that was probably a good thing because it, it made me struggle to get out kind of thing. I went through the usual thing of growing up, you know, just a regular kid, street kid, went to school, finished school, managed to get into probably was probably the only kid in my neighborhood to get into college. Did a year of that, absolutely hated it, studying electronic engineering. Uh, mainly because I just I just I wasn't cut out for it. I was very unhappy being in college, and I was dealing with a lot of the cl- like class issues and things like that. And then I said, "Well, screw that," and I went off to America. And I said, "I went, 
I told my uh, I told the professor I wanted to be in a, in a rock band. And within a couple of months, I'm playing on stage in CBGBs. And I end up in New York, very, very happy, amazing experience when the music stuff ended. I decided to go back to school as a night student. I studied graphic design. When I finished that, I ended up working in in mostly Wall Street investment banks and other places advertising. I did stints here, there, even in MTV and anywhere I could get work. I was working as a freelancer. So the, the money was good and I liked, I liked, I liked that kind of lifestyle. And that's the normal story. The back story is, is when I was 10, 10 years old. Oh, by the way, and, and to get to this point after I came, then I came back to Ireland. I wanted to be, I wanted to study or uh, work as a full time artist, which I was doing until 2008 when the, re- the international recession happened and affected this country quite badly and killed the arts business. And then I decided with nothing to do, I wrote a book on my my time in Wall Street and uh, called Puzzling People, The Labyrinth of the Psychopath, about the pathology and psychopathy inherent in normal society. And even that had a lot of occult references in it, but it wasn't necessarily aimed at that market. And that became a bestseller, and that gave me a life as a writer. So that's where I've been there ever since. Now, in terms of magical path, I picked up David Conway's Magic of Primer when I was about 11. I bought it on Easton's Bookshop in Dublin, fascinated by the black cover, I think with the with the sigil on the cover, and took it back home. And it was in, incredibly intriguing to me, fascinating. And I tried one of the I tried like one of the talismans in it to protect me from a bully in school. And the next day he had broken both his legs. So it had basically discovered very early on that there was something to this stuff. Tremendous interest in that, in the paranormal, in 40 and stuff. A big part of my life growing up was when we were 11 years old. I had a, an instinctual hatred of the Catholic Church and Abrahamic religions in general, which I carry to this day. Not the people, the actual faiths themselves. I feel that they should not be never been allowed to flourish in this part of the world. And they took us to Newgrange, which is on the the, the, the River Boyne, which is where the, most of the megaliths in Ireland are. It was about 10 or 11. And uh, it just blew my mind. It just, I could not believe what I was seeing, taking us into passage chambers that were 5,000 years old, seeing the artwork by our Neolithic ancestors on the wall, on the buildings, these incredible designs. And then they took us after that to see the head of a dead Catholic saint in a, a nearby cathedral in a city nearby. And I, the next day in school, I said to the, the teacher was talking all about this amazing St. Oliver Plunkett who died for Ireland. And I said, I want to talk about, can we talk more about the the place in the Boyne Valley? And he said, oh, that's just, that was just the, where they worship the dead. So irony was very instantaneous in terms of a learning curve at an early age. But I knew right there and then that that was my path in life, that I would completely reject mainstream just about everything, especially religion. And I knew there was more to this reality than, you know, what we what we were told was reality. And that's not to say I was anti-science or anything. I was actually a science nerd. I was very interested in electronics. But I only found that my interest in electronics only copper fastened my belief in the occult and the power of intention and so on and the ability to transform forces beyond their physical bodies. So that's basically how I got to this point. And in recent times, I've written a book called Sorcery, the Invocation of Magic, after writing books on things like druids and, and megaliths and so on prior to that. And it was sort of the culmination of 30 years of dabbling, well, 30 years of offending my parish priest, really, has brought me to this point. So, yeah, that that's where I, that's my magical history, I guess. You know, Ireland has a a rich folk magic history to it. When did you first discover that? You know, you mentioned you wrote a book about the Druids and um, the Celtic folklore is pretty rich. I was just curious, you know, when you actually discovered that world for the first time too. My grandmother was a country woman and even and uh, she used to terrorize us as kids with stories about the Banshee and all these other fairies and stuff. And she absolutely believed in the fairies and absolutely believed in the in things like the Banshee and it was that, that was that that was real to her. And was terrified of them, as most traditional Irish people were. They were absolutely terrified of the fairies. They didn't see the fairies the way that Walt Disney portrays them as Tinkerbell and so on. They saw them as like comparable, if not like demons, absolutely demons, or comparable to jinn in the Middle East and things like this. So she got me interested in that. And it was, and it was just, uh, I can remember like an experience I had when I was a child being quite frightened after watching a BBC documentary about ghosts. And 
I was lying in bed and the wardrobe beside me started shaking violently and, and fell over on top of me. Luckily, it was a small wardrobe and not a lot in it. But there was this, there was this like a catalytic exteriorization phenomena, which I didn't know what that was at the time. It, it actually had happened for me, but through a, a sh- quite being quite frightened. And so, it, you know, and I was always told these things. And I, I, I'd been, you know, I'd went, I started camping around rural Ireland from a, quite an early age, like 13, 14. My friends and I used to get buses and trains down the country and camp around the mountains. Even the mountains around Dublin, very, very strong. Uh, magical the, the hellfire club and everything was right there and just having these strange experiences seems strange lights uh, talking to people who live there and and you know uh, it's very difficult for people to grasp that outside rural communities and maybe not today but up until quite recently people really 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 do believe in fairies and folk magic and this kind of thing it's 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 a fact of life and so that was where my interest in that came from and then just talking to older folks just talking to elderly people and partially i'm involved in a product at the moment of like i'm going to try and record as many of them before they die in order to have them on camera talking about this stuff but yeah very very rich sadly dying in the like everything else in the since the arrival of television in the 60s but it's it's still there it's there, believe it or not there's still it, even here where i live and i don't live in pure rural Ireland, semi-rural Ireland. There are still people who practice folk magic and folk cures like you would not believe. It's still there. Yeah, it's an interesting history to me. I do have some roots there myself. Never been there, but I have some family ancestry that comes from the area. And I, to be honest, man, I have not taken a whole lot of time to learn about it. And going through your work recently in preparation for this conversation has sort of inspired me to look deeper into that history. So I will definitely be reading more about, you know, your life and your work, because uh, full disclosure, Sorcery is the first book of yours that I've read. So I haven't read the uh, Druid Code, which I've seen around for years now, but I've never just picked it up. So uh, this has definitely inspired me to, to seek that out further, too. And I will say, though, you know, from what I do know about you, you are known, I think, for you know, making sorcery and the occult accessible and human. And you say in the book, actually, that's because sorcery and the occult are human, which I thought was fantastic. And I can appreciate that. And I know the audience can too. That's one compliment, Thomas, that I've also received for the show here, that I've made these topics accessible through the podcast and my own approach to it. Although I'm not nearly as experienced in it on an intellectual level or a ritual level as you are, But I do think we share the same approach, and you articulated it very well in your book. You actually wrote that you don't present yourself as this great mystic, and you also consciously avoid complex theories and archaic language. And I like that approach. I do that myself, you know, more out of necessity for me than choice, just because, like I said, I don't have the depth or the breadth of knowledge. You know, because I learned a long time ago, I guess, that if you can't explain something complex in simple terms, then you really don't understand it. So it's clear to me after reading your book and watching some of your videos, too, that you know what the hell you're talking about here. Well, thanks for that, because all my work in all the subjects I've written about have been about stripping down the flair and getting it down to the basis of how it works and why it works and why people need to incorporate it into their life. Yeah, it's absolutely true. I mean, that, I'm not disparaging complex, arcane uh, ritual and ceremonial magic, not at all. That was that was of its time. But things have changed a lot since the times when William Butler Yeats and McGregor's Mathers and Crowley were involved in the Golden Dawn. The, the world is a very, very different place. And in terms of energy, energy is far easier to procure nowadays than it was a century ago when you did when you probably did require. Look, if, if you grew up in very easily in some semi-aristocratic background, you never really had a hard life. You're, you're going to find it very difficult to generate the levels of energy that you need in order to smash through the matrix. So you're going to have to indulge in complex rituals, making them as terrifying and as mysterious and strange as possible in order to smash through these gates of reality. Well, nowadays, in the same way, you can compress the same emotions that you'd have in a Wagnerian three-hour opera into a three-minute rock song as energy forces and consciousness and our experience within the cosmos becomes increasingly increasingly compressed it's also far more volatile and it's far more powerful it's taking a, a dispersed piece amount of energy 
and compressing it into a small space. This is why I'm constantly using the uh, the analogy of things like hadron colliders and things like this. We now have an abundance of an abundance of energy that our ancestors simply didn't have. For instance, if you want to charge, if you wanted to get the same ex- excitement to charge a sigil in the Victorian times, you would probably have to go fox hunting, which is, by the way, is a is is definitely based on on some kind of ceremonial magic, or go to battle. Nowadays, you can go into a roller coaster, and you can when a roller coaster is going on the the, the the drop from the top to the bottom. You can power your intentions into sigil with all these people screaming around you. These kinds of vast outpourings of energy, rock concerts, being in the front row of like a of a heavy metal or a punk rock or something show. Uh, that's tremendous force of energy that people can tap into. Again, that didn't ex- that didn't exist in genteel Victorian times. So we're very fortunate in many ways. So we don't have to go to all the complexity through ceremonial magic. And if you want to do that, God bless you. That's your own business. It's none of mine. Good luck to you. It works for you. But it's not necessary. It's not necessary. Ever since the arrival of chaos in the 70s, there's really no need for that anymore, except maybe you you probably enjoy that aspect of it. It's the ability that we have to generate forces around us. And what we have today is kind of made a a new kind of folk magic. And people really, you know, for instance, like the the transmission of, of, of emotions is so much more easier. You could break up with somebody on the other side of the world who's completely in love with you by sending some predictive text message on your phone instead of like having to write a you know, or, or make them fall in love with you instead of having to write a, employ a troubadour like you had, would do in the 14th century or write them mm-hmm. ex, long, long love letters. It's amazing. It's amazing how much energy we have available to us now. Let's use it. Let's 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 push the the archaic intense study aside. We're no longer no people are no longer having voluminous amounts of encyclopedias in their house in order to get knowledge. They have it at their fingertips and their phone. Well, magic works the same way. It's gone the same way. Definitely, man. And you mentioned your book, uh, your latest book, Sorcery: The Invocation of Strangeness, earlier and. In- came out pretty strong in it with this sort of, I guess, frontispiece piece of text at the beginning. And when I read it, well, you know, let me just reenact my reaction here. I think I said something like, oh, ho, ho, shit. And I reacted that way because it articulated something that I'd been thinking about for months now. And I, I just want to read this uh, for the audience here. You wrote that magic has gone the way of romantic intimacy Broadcasted to the world and the power of the experience is gone. Sorcery must be secretive and precious. So let's start the conversation about the book right there. You sound quite, I don't want to say it, but maybe disenchanted with the current state of magic. Why? Exhibitionism is not becoming of creativity. You know, Mozart didn't create his operas or his concertos by standing in front of a hundred people and going and making it up, neither did the, the great artists do the same. Neither did the great love affairs. They don't happen in public. We live in an age of crass exhibitionism that really began in the 60s. And as a result, the magical vitality of Western people has generally went downhill big time. The stereotype of the wizard in their tower exists for a reason. It's a solitary thing. And I think this is where... This is now. I'm not saying people shouldn't join coffins or they shouldn't join magic circles. Look, if some people prefer to be a star, a single star shining in the sky, that's good. If they prefer to hang in a constellation of stars, beautiful. There's no problem with that. I'm just saying, look, if if you're going to, if you're going to change the nature of reality, only you are going to be able to do it. Only you are going to have that experience. So therefore, why do you need a team? Why do the great songwriters, they don't generally in pop music write in groups, some do, but most don't. They write alone. The great artists, musicians, and so on. Magic is, comes from the same process. It's a combination of a personal experience, life, one's life experience, one's engagement with the, the material universe, and coupled with a need to slot your particular relationship with the universe into a modality of intention, thinking, creativity, and achievement of what you want of your desires. This is a very personal thing. It's a very personal thing. And uh, I, this is why, like, when I talk about, like, in romance and stuff like that, the only only person who knows what a broken heart feels like is not the two people in the couple. It's the one person. 
the only pair, like if two people fall in love, each one has a completely different or similar or different, but still different version of what their feeling is for the other person. And it thrives in intimacy. Magic thrives in seclusion. Your most greatest moments of magical potency will be what, which I did last year, walking through the Odenwald Forest alone in Germany at night. You're so detached from the, the miasma of noise around you that society carries with it that there's just you and your own ass staring into the abyss and if you want to know yourself that's when you'll know yourself and if you want to know when you'll smash through the barriers that's when you'll break through the barriers it's an extremely personal thing and it's been because of shall we say socialized sorcery and ceremony again which kind of a lot of that grew out of culture as well i mean Generally, this, the, the practitioners of the past, and I'm talking about probably from the shamans of the neo, proto-shamanic tribes of the Neolithic, and even the druids and so on, and all the way through the the, the cunning folk of Europe and through all these these other ideas, the satyrs of, of the Norse world, true to very recently were all solitary practitioners, the witches of so the witches of the, of Europe and so on, generally solitary, and even if a shaman or someone was employed by the tribe. To move outside reality, it again, it was a solitary personal thing. They went away and did something. They didn't do it in front of the crowd. And I often find it, a, I don't know, I, I mean, again, it could be that the, that maybe these Victorians who and these people back in the Renaissance who developed these group rituals probably couldn't achieve the same levels of energy on their own. But I do think that's one of the things that's one of the great tragedies of magical, magical practice is that a lot of people seem to think they have to join a group or a circle. And that's not true at all. Yes, you may learn things, but ultimately any experience you're going to have is going to be deeply personal. So, you know, why bring in middlemen when you can probably do it yourself? And that actually brings up another quote that you have here. You know, so we're talking about sorcery being secretive and precious, but you also said that it's the ultimate feedback loop between consciousness and the cosmos and who and what we are will ultimately be what we conjure. And I love that. I'm not sure what it means for me personally, because I still think I'm trying to figure out who I am and what I am. But how important do you think that is, you know, uh, knowing thyself before delving into any sort of magical practice? Well, you don't really know who you are until you reach a crisis in your life. This is why so many people who have gone through a crisis or a difficult period have actually found it to be a blessing. It changed them for the better. You need these things, and magic works the same way too. You've got to push yourself to the limits in order to figure out who you are. You just said there, Ryan, you don't even know who you fully are. You're not supposed to. I don't. Most of us don't. This is why it's called life. We're embarking on this this, this journey. Now, the idea is to, is to try and get insights onto how we can actually enjoy this experience better. Ultimately, my book, Sorcery, is really a book about how to have a more joyous life. Now, it might deal with dark subjects and dark topics, but ultimately it's about how to better yourself as a person for your own experience on this five-sized reality on this planet orbiting this minor star. It's ultimately about that. This is why I encourage people to, to look into magic and sorcery and the occult, because there's a lot there for them, just like there's a lot in art. There's a lot there for them to actually grow as a person. And just as an artist might express their innermost desires on a canvas with some paint, you will also find these things happening as you practice magic, particularly things in dreams. Now, I op- I started writing that book at the very beginning to try and alter the consciousness of the readers. That's why I began talking about the subconscious mind and the ideas of Lovecraft's Cthulhu, and I, I, a kind of a satire I, I performed on a megalithic site here in the west of Ireland, where I considered, I didn't do it, but I, it works well in the context of the book, invoking Cthulhu from the abyss, from the depths. And then the book goes through a period of talking through, you know, a dream I had regarding the moon. That was deliberately written to affect the reader's conscience at the start of the book, almost like a parable, almost like to target the subconscious immediately, to immediately get in there and then have them working on themselves through dreams. And that's very, very, that's very important because the feedback loop is ultimately giving you what you what you need from this life and not what you want. That's really what it is. And particularly in the case of dreaming, not enough is 
is given to this in terms of a lot of a magical practice. They don't talk about this enough in most of the, the, the texts that I've read. And that must be in the, the thousands by this point. But your dreams are very, very important. Your dreams are very important. And they are the feedback loop that will tell you where you're going right and wrong in your life. And magic is a great way of scientifically, and I mean that in a very literal sense, tampering with your consciousness in order to affect its relationship with the cosmos in order to make that relationship more streamlined. So you will get messages telling you you're doing something wrong in your life and you can you must change it. Well, magic can actually be used instead of it happen, happening in a passive level by accident. You can actually play with these ideas and then your, con- your subconscious mind will actually give you the information you need in order to require them. And also with that, things like synchronicities as well. Of course, synchronicities are the kind of the daylight waking version of the the conscious feedback loop that you get from this. The idea is to use sorcery and magic to make this as much a part of your life as nutrition, respiratory, uh, your pulmonary system on your your, your nervous system. It's, It's to make your life better and to make you a better person. Yeah, man, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And you mentioned Cthulhu and you were writing about that that topic and how it's as real as the guardian angels in Christianity or the titans of ancient Greece, because like these other things, you know, human consciousness is capable of making it real. And because it's come up here, you know, I've always found it intriguing that Lovecraft, for example, uh, he didn't believe in the supernatural, yet he made a career writing about it. But that does harken back to human consciousness, because if that is the catalyst that brings things into existence, then nothing would exist until we think of it, right? So the supernatural, yeah. whatever that means, I mean, doesn't exist until someone conjures up a supernatural experience for themselves, and then it does. Am I making any sense here? Absolutely. Lovecraft was a reluctant shaman. That's what was wrong with him. He was like and Van Gogh, to a degree, as a painter, was a reluctant shaman as well. Lovecraft, as a child, had these tremendous experiences with these things they called the night gaunts. And that's basically where his Lovecraftian Cthulhu mythos derived from. He wrote it down as fiction, almost because I believe he was terrified that it might be true. Uh, it's just you cannot write the stories like that he's written, like The Haunter in the Dark, and, and write them uh, short stories with that profundity and that depth of targeting the subconscious minds of people who read them and not have the, some kind of shamanic insight. Absolutely he did. It's probably what destroyed him. It's probably this inability to accept the true nature of this being that was what tore Lovecraft to pieces in this reality. He, he was constantly raging against modernity, but he ultimately he was raging against himself. And I believe the thing, the lot of fears that he had of minorities was because those minorities represented cultures where magic was real, where magic was a fact. You mean even the call of Cthulhu. He deliberately brings in the point of uh, having the Cajuns down in, in New Orleans involved in a black occult thing. This is what he saw when he saw when he was, you know, yeah, he was a man of his time. Absolutely. I mean, America wasn't a very pleasant place for immigrants at that period, but that was just how life was. But to him, his relationship with immigration was very different than, say, just xenophobia or anything like that. He, he, he saw those people as a reminder of the fact that he had a soul. That's really what it came down to. Yeah, and you know, you use this phrase, the aeon of Cthulhu in the book, and I love that. Explain to people what that means exactly. You know, Crowley had his his aeon of Horus, which came to pass. We know that we have rock and roll and everything because of this. But I think it ended sooner than expected. And I think somehow Lovecraft jumped in with, with his passive or accidental age of Cthulhu. And yes, we live in an age where the subconscious mind is bringing up a lot of things from the depths. We live in a very strange time where people, I mean, I saw a story the other day about an artist who cut his penis off and served that as dinner. We have all these issues with people, all these multiple gender issues. Again, I don't care what you believe you are, but it's just funny that it all happens at this time. We have lots of people tra- changing their sex and so on. And that's just because the, 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 the Cthulhu has risen from the depths has risen in human consciousness. It has come up from the depths. And it's, it's showing us that Western society is basically on a wrong path. This may be a precursor to some kind of premonition of transhumanism or that kind of post-humanist technology that the likes of Elon Musk and Bill Gates and the singularity and so on are presenting us with. And this is kind of a, a scrambling of consciousness 
But Cthulhu, would, you know, you cannot have a story or a mythos that's fictional and have that much emotional energy poured into it. And particularly, who are the ones who first discover Lovecraft? Well, young teenage boys and girls when they're 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 basically a cauldron of sexual power and all kinds of other social powers in terms of like both good and bad. And it, you know, they 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 charge they charges mythos into into reality coupled with that we have numerous Lovecraftian video games based on the Cthulhu mythos and board games and it just never ends it's bigger than ever and it ties in beautifully with all the the Jungian type of ideas of the subconscious mind and the depths of the ocean representing the depths of the subconscious human in terms of possible dysfunctionalities which in reality are actually indicators of things we can actually change for the better so, yeah, I mean, I mean, in years to come, in centuries to come, people will probably talk about uh, Lovecraft in the same terms that they talk about, like Julius Caesar books on the Gauls or the Celts or, or these kinds of books that fundamentally changed human perception at the time. And it did unleash something in humanity that was probably needed or probably was very insightful. So, yeah, well, I, I have no doubt in saying that. We are living in the age of Lovecraft, whether we want to or not, we are. Yeah, it's kind of hard to disagree with that, to be honest. And another quote here about that, you wrote that Lovecraft sorcery is indeed working, which you've been talking about. But then you also said, you know, shifts in human consciousness and cultural convulsion have always been complemented with subaquatic monsters representing the symbolic depths of the society undergoing these changes. By becoming something of a Captain Nemo, exploring these psychic depths beforehand can save you from being consumed by them when they finally emerge. Well, that was a pretty interesting uh, statement there. And there's another connection here that I'd like to make for the listeners. You also said that human consciousness is intrinsically linked with bodies of water. What do you mean by that? Well, I think it's uh, just like we have the embryonic fluid of our mother's wombs that we were gestated in. Our consciousness, I believe, is somehow intrinsically connected to the depths of the ocean. And this is not, you know, unique to me or me or, or even Celtic culture or anything, but it's it, 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 all so many myths. There's no Irish creation myth in the, in the Irish mythological canon, except a very strange story that does seem to pertain to a being or a sea monster. And this is going back, you know, you're talking about thousands of years, possibly called the Mata. This is identified in some of the ancient uh, or earliest Irish writings. And the, the Mata was a, a kind of a giant sea monster that came from the sea, ended up in the in the area of Newgrange, which I spoke to earlier on, and was part of the generation of the Irish pantheon of, of pagan gods. You have the Midgard serpent in the Norse tradition. You have the idea of the, the plain of Vigrid during the Ragnarok, where it, flo- it sinks to the bottom of the sea and comes up again. And all these things, these ideas of the, the, the depths of the human consciousness is somehow found in the depths of the ocean as you know james joyce called it the snot the snot green sea the all-encompassing mother it's down there we stare at the surface of the ocean and we think it's so beautiful but down there are billions of creatures some of them horrific looking tearing one another to pieces what we're seeing is a physical or a biological or a a an aquatic version of what our own subconscious is like where the billions of beings and monsters in terms of our neuroses, our feelings, our inclinations and our desires are tearing one another pieces down there as well. And I think our earliest ancestors in all the cultures were very aware of that. They looked into the ocean long before they looked into the stars and the constellations. This is probably why there's, no, there's almost no star lore within Celtic society. Well, not in Ireland anyway. And they were looking at the sea. They were seeing at the sea. You have the old years of islands that vanished, high Brazil, Tirna, no, the land beyond the sea. All these ideas of these these ancestors who are now under the sea, and so on. So it's like that's it. You that's what that's the relationship. Our all encompassing mother. We stare out to see what we're staring into the depths of our own our depths of our own subconscious minds. Definitely, man. And speaking of subconscious minds, you mentioned a dream earlier that you had that you put in the book, and I had a note here that I would love for you to tell us about that. You call it the dream of the moon and the sea, and let's just sit back and have some story time for a moment. Go ahead and take us through that dream, if you don't mind. About 2000, I saw a documentary on the Discovery Channel. I was living in Dublin at the time. I was working there. I was watching this thing about, and they were they were talking about how, how odd the moon was, that the moon... The Earth's moon was too big for the, for the Earth. 
how it was just the right size to form an eclipse in front of the sun, how it was just the right size for a lunar eclipse, how it it plays a much more vital role in the reg in this planet than a profound role, I must I might say, in this planet than say the moons of other planets. They don't have the same effects, well, as far as we know, on them on their on their planet to the level that the their lunar lunar one does have here. And then all the ideas, and I was just thinking about that, and I was going over, and this is really strange, and I knew there was like kind of conspiracy theories among certain kind of UFO type people that the moon was a was a was was a spaceship and this kind of, but never really got into that. Couldn't really believe it because if that was the case, why you know other planets have moons? It's just the Earth's moon was so strange to me, and also the fact it's much older than the Earth. It's another another weird one, and so I guess just in a kind of a, I drifted off into my sleep into a kind of a meditative process. And then I had a dream, which I can only describe as, as, as a near psychedelic experience. Like I had some, someone had, someone had intravenously given me psilocybin mushrooms while I was asleep or something. But it was one of these dreams that was almost, in fact, it wasn't a dream. It was a vision. It was a vision. That's probably a better way to put it. And, uh, you know, at the usual story, a voice that doesn't have a voice spoke to me and told me that at one time human consciousness existed in a primal form at the bottom of the deepest oceans and the deepest part of the oceans. It was the only place on the planet where it could survive because the, the surface of the planet was still in turmoil from asteroids hitting it, volcanic disruptions, the rain was toxic and so on. There was landscapes were pl- prone to sudden flooding and this kind of thing. And, uh, in order for human consciousness to get into the surface of the planet, it had to dream the moon into existence. And so human consciousness collectively dreamt the moon into existence, and that allowed the air to regulate its cycles. So it could have seasons, it could have tidal structure, and stabilize the surface of the planet. This allowed human consciousness, through various forms of evolution, to then rise to the surface, come out onto land, and eventually evolve into what we are today. So I woke up and I was like, fuck, that was the best dream I've ever had. <laughs> just felt wonderful. Yeah. I just felt wonderful, not, not traumatized or anything. Went up to go for a pee, then went to the kitchen to get a glass of water. And I looked out over the Irish Sea and there was a perfect crescent of the moon rising above the sea. And I looked at my bedside radio clock and it was 3.33 a.m. And I was just, I, I, it was such a moment of kind of like cosmic, magical, I don't know, theater that I burst out laughing and was filled with a, a very joyous feeling, not a sense of like, oh, I'm just, I'm this great mystic who, who had this incredible, like, you know, vision quest, whatever, and I've achieved this amazing insight. It was nothing like that at all. It was almost like, the you know, the gods do move in mysterious ways. They do like to entertain us as well as they like to uh, to taunt us. And I felt the combination of both. And I felt, that's how it felt. I felt like the gods were like, you know, and I say the gods, I, I mean that purely metaphorically now, uh, were, were actually giving me insights, but at the same time to making it almost fun. And that that's what happened then. Yeah, you wrote that the creation of the moon was the first act of sorcery undertaken upon this planet, and you just described that. I thought that was awesome. That's a great dream that I wish anybody could have, to be honest. So let's transition a little bit. I heard you say in a, a recent video, this was not in the book, but it does tie in, I guess, somewhat, but I heard you say in a recent video that that your main problem with the alternative scene is it's still infected by Christianity. And I was yeah. wondering if you could elaborate on that, you know, maybe define what you mean by the alternative scene to begin with, and then tell us exactly how it's infected. Well, the alternative, I mean, even a lot of magic is infected by Christianity, unfortunately. Now, I don't understand why these in these these ceremonial magicians use these these invocation of Christian archetypes. They were a power force at the time. So therefore, you could tap into them. You could tap into angels mentioned in the Bible because they were available power source at the time when Christianity really did mean something, and they were there for the using. Nowadays, we could just as easily use Batman or Spider-Man or, I don't know, any, you know, any superhero we wanted. It have the same level of power in terms of the, the prevailing cultural consciousness. So, uh, yeah, like the alternative scene, I don't know, like the, the kind of scene that I found myself getting pulled into when I first wrote my book on psychopaths. People, it's sort of like a conspiratorial alternative thinking. 
this kind of thing. And, I, and when I first became aware of this after I wrote Puzzling People, I found it quite exciting. I didn't realize there were so many people involved in wanting to have a different version of reality than what was presented by the mainstream media or by universities or by governments. Very healthy, I might add. But then found that they were falling into the same old traps. For instance, there's a whole there's a whole industry within alternative media of thinking Satanists are everywhere. And these people don't have a clue what a Satanist is, by the way. They will watch music videos and they will see, you know, someone like Beyonce or someone, anyone, Katy Perry, doing a certain thing by covering their hand on one eye or this kind of thing. And they'll, they'll write these like or make these YouTube videos or do these podcasts with, you know, these long exposés of how they're invoking Lucifer or Isis or, or you know, Kali. And it's all to do with Satanism and all this stuff. And then they always have these quotes from the Bible, like as if the Bible is the ultimate authority on human consciousness. And, and this has long bothered me, long bothered me. In fact, I spoke to one of the proponents of this at a conference in England recently. And I said, I cannot believe that you did a two hour show saying that pagan festival holidays were satanic, that Beltane and Valpurgis and things like the solstice were used by pagans to sacrifice babies to, to the devil and all this. And you call yourself like an alternative thinker and all you're doing is spouting Bible Belt Christianity at the end of the day. And it makes me mad. It makes me very angry because uh, it's the classic example of what the word revolution means. You've, you've opened up your mind and you just got back to where you started. You're back to where, you know, you, these people are basically a bunch of Jimmy Swaggarts and Oral Roberts. I mean, I watched another one the other night. And they were talk I was just I, I, I literally was, what am I watching? It was like these people, these great alternative minds who were breaking down some information about something. And, and it, it, it may as well have been the 700 Club. Endless Bible quotes. Everything that's not there, that they don't like as a Satanist or into Satanics, or all this kind of thing. It really bugs me and it really bothers me because it's not necessary. It creates a condition, deliberately I might add, that there's only one spiritual path on this earth, the Abrahamic traditions, that the only, the only reference you have in order to identify one belief system from another is a Christian belief system radically judging another system and, and so on. In an age where we have a vast amount of information regarding all kinds of other spiritual traditions without having to stand there with a Christian barometer deciding what's satanic and what isn't. Yeah, okay, so in that same video that I referenced that you said this in, you also had some pretty raw advice for people looking to manifest what they need or what they want. And you also took the act of praying to task, saying it's pretty much useless. And I'd maybe agree, but I guess part of me thought that praying itself was a form of magic or manifestation. Is it not, then? Not to me. I mean, to me, praying is the welfare system of the universe. It's begging for something. You get nothing for nothing in this universe. But you have to make an exchange. You have to give up something. If you're praying to a deity saying, dear deity, dear, you know, sky fairy in the Middle East, whatever, please make me get this, get better. Please make my, you know, my wife have a baby. Please, this, please, that. Well, what are you offering in terms of sacrifice? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Where in every other prior spiritual tradition from European paganism in the European traditions and everywhere you go, you must make a sacrifice in order to get something. You must sacrifice. It is an exchange of energy. It's like an investment, a magical or a, an, an energetic investment in the cosmos that you're, per, you're particularly giving something to in order to hope that you manifest what you want. So therefore, you give money to the poor, or in like in pagan Roman times, you might have you sacrificed the goat to the emperor, or and you walk a certain distance, starved yourself, and this kind of thing. But simply sitting there praying, going, uh, "Could I please have this?" It's like being on the spiritual dole. It's begging. It's not achieving, and that's why I think it it's not it doesn't work for a lot of people. Now you could say there are ways of praying that could be magical. I totally agree with you, Ryan. There. So an invocation or an invocation of a higher entity coupled with sacrifice would probably would work. So a, a guy goes into a, you say you're a Catholic and you go into a church, giving a load of money to the Catholic church is not going to be any use because chances are it's going to go to some pedophile priest who's like going to pay off a lawyer at some point to get him out of prison. No, no, give money to someone on the outside who's on the street who's poor 
or something like that, or an old lady down the street who can't afford her electric bill, pay her electric bill, then go into church and then pray because you've made a sacrifice. And it has to be a real sacrifice. It's no use being a billionaire, giving up a hundred dollars to somebody. You have to be really willing to sacrifice. So that's why I don't have a lot of faith in prayer. I much prefer the, the pagan system of sacrifice. Well, those are fair points, man. And you know, you also wrote in the book that the Western magical tradition has been under attack by the Abrahamic religions for a couple thousand years. And you mentioned the probably fictional story of St. Patrick converting pagans to the Church of Rome. Now, that's that's some magical propaganda right there, probably. Yeah. And I know you think that the pagan persecution in the West doesn't get talked about enough. So give us a few more thoughts on that. You know, how has this persecution affected native European belief systems? Well... When the, the Library of Alexandria was attacked, and I'll go a bit further than that, we'll say in the earliest days of Christianity, when the iconic, iconoclasts started showing up and attacking statues, believing that demons were inside them and destroyed 70% of the art of the Western world, there were something like 70 million pagans in Europe. There was no Christians. Today there isn't one. There's not one. Now, there are people who are neo-pagans who revived it, but there's no one in Europe today who can actually, with the exception of maybe the Sami, of northern Finland and northern Norway, with the exception of may- maybe them, maybe, there's not one pay person in Europe today that can say, I'm a pagan right back to my ancient ancestors. It has been utter and total annihilation. Utter and total annihilation. The greatest genocide and cultural annihilation and spiritual annihilation that the world has ever seen. And what was done in Europe became the template for what was done to the Native Americans, the Africans, all around the world, you name it. What happened was, in the third century, people don't understand. As if, if you want to want, know the true history of Christianity, get a book called uh, The Darkening Age by Catherine Nixie. came out last year, and she's a, an Oxford or a Cambridge professor, I'm not sure. And she wrote an unbiased, and it is a polemic, but it's, a, it's an honest polemic, of the early days of Christianity. And it was basically, it would make ISIS look like a teddy bear's picnic. These people were insane. They were cutting their penises off to prove how pious they were. They attacked anyone that wasn't Christian. You had the groups like the Stylites who stood atop pillars of pagan temples until their entrails exploded and fell out and rained down on their followers. This is the early days of Christianity. And after he boiled his wife alive in a bathtub, the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great had decided that these Christians were so unbelievably bonkers that they'd make great soldiers because they've no fear of debt. And that's how you, and not you, but that's how we all became Christians. Our ancestors became Christians in the West. It was a brutal force. Pagan temples and groves were destroyed in their tens of thousands. Druids, satyrs, all kinds of holy men murdered. Anyone who did not submit to the rule of Christianity, whether they were Saxons in northern France, in northern Germany, they are 4,000 that were headed in one day by Charlemagne. If it, if it wasn't that, it was the Cathars, who were also a different kind of Christianity. One million, one and a half million of them exterminated by Christians. And it went on. I mean, the Crusades, they always talk about the Crusades attacking the Middle East. The Crusades were set up to attack Europeans. First the Cathars, and then it didn't finish until the 1400s with the Third Swedish Crusade against the pagans of Karelia in, northern fin- in Finland and northern Russia. That's how obsessed Christians were with destroying the indigenous religions of the spiritual tradition of Europe. It went on for the better part of a thousand years, and it's still going on to a certain degree. There were still witchcraft, witchcraft laws on the books all over Europe. The one in England was only abolished in like the 1950s. And to this day, if anyone decides, even in, even in countries like England, not so bad in Ireland, but in England or somewhere, if you decide to set up a neo-pagan cult, you'll have the local minister or priest coming down there and call, accusing you of being a Satanist. These are the kind of things that goes on. And it's really shocking that people of European heritage, we were the first Native Americans. We were the first Aborigines of Australia. We were attacked first by the Abrahamic religions, and in particular Christianity. Now, Christianity also attacked the Jews as well. So it was actually basically a, a, an almost a mind virus that came out of Judaism. But it, this is amazing to me, and we've lost so much. All the witch hunts, all the genocides of the Cathars and later the Jews, and all these kinds of things, these were all rooted in this, this, this virus, that came, this mind virus that came out of the Middle East called Christianity. 
which we're told was this beautiful, wonderful thing that people accepted. And if you start looking at the history, not one single group in Europe wanted to become Christian. They were all forced. And why would they? Their original religions were far more beautiful. To the same point, you also mentioned the war against the Irish magical tradition it included the destruction of the Ohm, which is a magical writing system. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Ohm. It's a tricky Ohm. one. Ohm. Like a, a Ohm. resistor. Ohm. I've not read much about that myself, so maybe you could tell us a bit about that magical writing system and its use and legacy in your local folk magic. Well, Ohm script was the system of writing used in Ireland prior to the arrival of the Roman world through Christianity. And it it definitely had a magical aspect to it. There's no doubt about that. It worked in a very similar system to how the runes of the Nordic or the Anglo-Saxon or the Germanic world work, in that when you inscribed a a phrase in, in the script onto stone, leather, metal, wood, whatever, that you were actually invoking your conscience permanently into the marking it was a it was a groove when you carved the groove or you scratched the mark or you had chiseled out the shape you were actually pouring your consciousness into it now in ireland we were told growing up in school that the own script i mean barely told told about it i might add was a very simple and primitive form of writing that early Christians brought to Ireland. And that is absolute bullshit. They told us that before the arrival of this fictional character called St. Patrick, that the Irish were basically living in the Stone Age. They were incredibly backward. This is None of this is true. That they were involved in human sacrifice, that it was a dark and horrible place. And then this beautiful thing called Christianity came along and made Ireland wonderful. And it's just pure nonsense for so many reasons. But one of the things they talked about was the Ohm script. And they said the Ohm script was Christian. Well, if you look at, we we have 300 examples of Ohm stones. These are large standing stones that were, that would have the the Ohm script written on them. And you read from the bottom going up to the top. Of them, 290 of them have absolutely no reference to Christianity on them. And the other 10 are iffy. They could have been changed along the way. So, to say that the Ohm script was invented by Christians, the first Christians in Ireland, is absolute nonsense, especially when you look at some of the phrasing used on the Ohm script. Terms like son of the raven born, alive like fire. These are very much magical pagan ideas, totemistic ideas of invoking animals, invoking nature spirits into oneself, into one's land. So, for instance, if your family it was in ancient Ireland and they wanted to sanctify the land that belonged to the tribe or whatever, a large standing stone would be hoisted up and then the druid using a chisel would carve out some magical phrase like this uh, land is sanctified to Ryan and his and his sons and is blessed by the Morrigan goddess, son of the raven born. This is pure totemistic paganism. Absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. And Getting information when I was growing up prior to the internet on the own was extremely difficult. And again, it was the same kind of academic cold documents saying it was just a primitive form of writing early Christians used in Ireland. And it soon became, to me, apparent that that was an absolute lie. Like so much of the, the there's, there's a period of Irish antiquity, which they claim is missing for about four, 500 years from the late Iron Age up until the early Christian period. It's not missing. They just moved it. They just messed around the dates so it fit in nicely with Christianity. But anyway, the Ohm script was neurotic to the Christians. They were terrified of it. So much so that it was, this is why so many of the Ohm stones were attacked by the early Christians in typical Christian, intolerant, iconoclastic ways. They knocked them over. They smashed them with hammers. They defaced them. Some of them would have looked like inverted crucifixes or something like that. They would have but as at all kind of phobias. They were also looked like penises, many of them. They were phallic, so that would have also created all kind of neuroses with these, these Christian monks. They toppled them over, they smashed them, they buried them. There's probably still hundreds of them still under the, just under this under the turf and under the grass around the arms that still haven't been found yet. But in sixteen sorry, in thirteen sixty, in my previous book the Druid Code, I found the smoking gun of a document in a book called the Book of Ballymote. 
And the book of Ballymote was a book, it contains a page where the Christian monks, and we're talking about a thousand years or so after Christianity, where they're still neurotic about this Ohm script. They have a decipher on how to read what it means. And they also were terrified of Ohm, or sorry, of runes, of the runes as well. And they have the Furtek rune, and they call it the Ohm of the Vikings. This suggests strongly that a magical world existed at the same time Christianity existed in Ireland for hundreds and hundreds, if not over a thousand years after St. Patrick arrived. That was where communications were sent and issued through Ohm, through this magical text that the Christians couldn't read, the monks couldn't read, the bishops couldn't read, but a certain initiate order of probably surviving Druids, almost certainly, because the Druids did survive in Ireland in a secular form right up until the 1600s. That's officially known, officially accepted, that they worked on the ground. And there was a great neuroses in the, in the, in the Christian church in Ireland that there was a belief in Rome that the Christian church in Ireland, the so-called Celtic church, was really a bunch of Druids pretending to be Christians, and they were actually infiltrating Christianity from the inside. That's absolutely 100% true. That's why the, the Vatican abolished the, the Celtic church at the Synod of Whitby, because they, the thing was crawling with Druids pretending to be Christians, undermining it from the inside, particularly a group called the Chaldeas. And they were basically saving Irish and Celtic traditions inside Christianity so they wouldn't be destroyed. And so this was a fascinating stuff to me. And the Ohm script to this day has a very, very powerful charge. If you actually work on it, it's a very powerful cipher. And it has not been fully capitalized or utilized yet at this point. Now, uh, it's getting more and more popular with people putting it on tattoos. I have one myself. It's starting to be used more and more in Irish neo-pagan magic rituals. Thank God I was getting tired of going to these events and people were still evoking uh, Christian archetypes and so on. It definitely has a power. It's, it's at a dormant power, but it's a power force that's resurgent. And that's why I wrote about it in both the, the Druid Code and in Sorcery, the Invocation of Strangers, because it's one more tool we can use to shift and alter our consciousness. And I think this is the main reason why academics and aren't to this day basically suppress it it's the strangest thing I, I finally got a lifetime ambition to visit university college cork to see their collection of ohm stones which have sadly been pulled off the landscape and held in one's location but it was an opportunity to see them and they're literally held like prisoners in the dungeon these magical stones are strapped against wall by steel bars at the end of a dungeon as if they're as if they have a power that the the academics and the, the Jesuits who run these colleges are terrified of. So it's, it's that's 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 why I made that. I, I, there wasn't enough out there in a world because I have a global audience in a global sense understanding of Irish uh, Irish magical ideas such as the own that I put it in the book in order to kind of broaden the ideas to start shifting our consciousness and people of of Celtic heritage to start exploring these things. It's the same way that people of Nordic heritage. And Viking heritage was starting to explore the ruins. This is our this is our magical heritage, and we need to protect it. More importantly, we need to incorporate it into our lives. Definitely, man. I totally agree with that too. And you know, let's round out our free content here with the last question before we get into some Patreon bonus material. You've also in the book related the societal class structure to magic as well. Obviously, we're familiar with that class system in terms of you know economics. But how do you see the magical class system dividing out? Is it similar? Are all the good magical ritual, you know, sort of like funneled up to the top while the rest of us are stuck paying for Western yoga classes and fancy meditation techniques? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, just like there's a financial economic class system where they stole all the money for themselves, there's also a, a class system based on magic and sorcery. What did they do in the past? They killed all our witches, all our healers, all our wise women all our warlocks, all our druids, all our satyrs. Do you think they did nothing with that magic? No, they kept it for themselves. And that's why you had groups such as the, who did survive under the radar, such as the, the it did actually survive better in cities. But this is why, this is why we're back to the solitary thing again. The ones who survived were solitary practitioners, whether they were in Portugal or Ireland or Spain or France or Germany, or even in New England in the Europe early days of the Puritans and so on, the magicians at the time had to go underground. Now, at the same time, all this magical 
booty was collected up by the aristocrats and brought into their stately home. So while they were telling the rest of us not to practice magic or they would prosecute us through witchcraft laws, they themselves were openly doing it inside their stately mansions and their palaces. Now, books such as the Dennis Wheatley books, now Dennis Wheatley being a good British insider, those books that he wrote, All the Devil Rides Out, and all these books he wrote, Strange Conflict, and all these the stories he wrote, all about aristocrats inside stately homes and mansions across England and Ireland and, and Britain doing magic rituals. It was whistleblowing. He was telling us what they were doing. At the same time, they were telling us to practice reason. They were all joining Freemasonic orders and practicing in rituals. At the same time, they were burning our you know, our witches, they were collecting all the stuff and doing it for themselves inside their own gated communities at the time. And they're doing it again today with the with they're trying to do it again today with the with the magical class system developing in technology on the internet and so on. But they got the fright of their lives of what happened with 4chan and Keck and Menix and all this. There's suddenly a, a kind of a digital folk magic arrived. But well, yeah, this is the whole, this has been the agenda from day one, as, at least since the arrival of Christianity. Magic has been taken off the peasants, been ha- taken indoors by the wealthy and the affluent, and they practice it themselves. And in the book, Source of the Invocation of Strangers, I outline the minutes of a, do- of, a, of a document anyone can buy about the occult history of the Soviet Union. As soon as the Soviet Union fell, there was a fire sale where literally all these Western academics and foundations went over to the Soviet Union and bought up every book and document they could find dealing with Soviet occult and then held them in 1991 at a conference in Fordham University in the Bronx in New York, sponsored by none other than the George Soros Foundation. If you want any more proof that the elites and the power forces are obsessed with magic, sorcery and the cult, that's it. They tell the rest of us it doesn't exist, it's hocus pocus, or they make it illegal while they themselves practice it. It was like, what, I think it was J.P. Morgan, no, it was Vanderbilt, who said, millionaires don't do astrology, billionaires do astrology. And these people were obsessed with the occult, obsessed with magic, and still are to this day. They just want to keep it for themselves, just like they kept the money. And so that's why this book is important in some levels for me personally. It's almost like a, a revolutionary text and we shouldn't say a revolution, insurgency text, where to say to the ordinary people, stop being intimidated by the aristocrats, by the elites who are actually having all the magic. Grab some for yourself. Storm the magical barricades. Tear down the magical walls and get in there and get a piece of this action for yourself and bring it into your own life because they've been doing it and that's why they have the power and you don't. Start learning to take the power back yourself. Amen, dude. Amen. So we are at the end of our time here. I do appreciate you hanging out for as long as you did. Please do tell people where they can find your latest book, Sorcery, The Invocation of Strangeness, and your other work as well. My website is thomassheridanartsarts.com. The link to everything is from there. On YouTube, most of my occult videos are on Open Source Occult TV channel on YouTube. Awesome. Well, Thomas Sheridan, really appreciate your work and your time, like I said. Would love to have you back again because I got a ton more questions from this book that I was not able to ask in our time frame here. But I would love to have you back again sometime, man, if you're up for it. Oh, it'll be a pleasure. I really enjoyed myself, Ryan. Enjoy the rest of your evening. All the best, Ryan. Thank you very much. And there you have it. My thanks again to Thomas Sheridan. You can get his latest book on Lulu.com, linked in the show notes as well as a couple YouTube channels he maintains and his personal website, which for some reason comes up as suspended in my browser. Not sure why that would be, but check him out however you can. I really like Thomas and his approach to magic or sorcery, whichever you prefer. The whole uh, it loses its luster if it's not secretive thing really resonates with me, and it harkens back to a similar point made by Eric Davis back in episode 68. Eric lamented the fact that the counterculture had been flooded into the mainstream to the point where it's cool and popular, but there's nowhere to go anymore to create true counterculture because all the nooks and crannies have been cleaned out. There aren't any edges to society anymore, and I think you could apply that same take to the old culture as well and to magical practices. I mean, yeah, I don't do ritual magic. Well, not in the traditional sense anyway. But I still think you need to keep some of it for yourself because you know the aristocratic types have kept plenty for themselves. It's kind of like art. I like to write, but not everything I've written is always seen by other people. Sometimes there are things just for me. 
Anyway, we jammed a lot into the Patreon extension, close to another hour with Thomas, and I still didn't get to everything I wanted to. But what we did get to was the Muse's role in magic. How fellow Irishman James Joyce used magic and alchemy in his writing, the Irish folk magic idea known as the Fetch. Nothing related to Mean Girls there, sadly. It's actually quite terrifying. Or can be. We also got into some other fun Irish folkloric stories. Talked a bit about Thomas's idea that, like art, some people are just better magicians than other people. In fact, Thomas said he thinks the difference between a pathological sorcerer is that they're not actually good at real sorcery, which took us onto the topic of bad magic or black magic. We talked a bit about how to recharge or rebuild your magical abilities, and then got really into stone magic, and how the Freemasons or the Stonemasons may have encountered true esoteric knowledge in the materials they were building with, and not necessarily through any ancient texts. And there's a connection here to the Druids as well. Quite an interesting idea this one is. Thomas also threw out his take on stones guarding entrances to the inner earth, which in hindsight seems like a metaphor for stones guarding that esoteric knowledge. And then we wrapped up with the magic of Malta, its esoteric landscape, and giants who may have lived there, as well as what getting stoned or being stoned may really mean. You can hear all of that at patreon.com slash oldculture, and much more for as little as two bucks a month. That's a hell of a deal, I think, and there were a slew of you who are new to Patreon who did hear this extension, so my thanks to new patrons Michael, Steve, Brian, Claudio, Jordan, and my man D.H. Slammer, and a huge thank you to Marcelo, Cameron, and Christopher, who became official executive producers of the show. Much love to each and every one of you. Also, make sure you check out our new merch, 10% off all orders with the coupon code Equinox through September 23rd. We got what I think is a cool new Baphomet t-shirt available. I also added a red Tribland tee with a yellow sigil. I think that's pretty legit. But please check it out for yourself. I'm going to add more fabric choices in the future too. Looking at hemp right now, but having issues with the print-on-demand service I started using recently, so I may just have to make the damn things myself. Time will tell, though, as it always does. And speaking of time, I am out of it for now, but I'll be back again real soon with a humongous episode. Nearly four hours. Well, it's over four hours right now, so we'll see how long it ends up, but you're going to want to come back for that one, and you're going to want to be on Patreon for that one, too, for sure. So until then, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.